All right, hello, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County, uh, coming to you by Zoom or YouTube or any other method of recording. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about ground covers and shade plants for home landscapes. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about some plants. You know, sometimes when we're looking at our landscape, uh, the ground covers or the plants that are in shaded areas might not be the ones that just immediately leap out at us. Uh, but they really are important as uh, areas uh, is you know filling in areas of the landscape uh, and giving a structure to the landscape. Um, so it's important that we think about we we want to make sure that we have plants that are going to be successful uh, and attractive uh, for us uh, there in the home landscape. We're going to start talking about ground covers uh, and ground covers. Uh, really do just what's in the name. They're going to be covering an area of ground. They tend to be low-lying plants. They're going to be less than three feet in height. We don't want them to be dominating, uh, but very often we use them as borders around buildings. Uh, we can use them as uh, kind of a way to unify individual plantings. If we have trees and shrubs in the landscape that we want to bring together uh, into a unified bed, and um, they really do a very good job of defining an area uh, and you can use them in combination uh, with turf and with paving to define paths and really give your landscape a, a wonderful structure. Uh, the plants themselves uh, can be evergreen, they can be deciduous, so you know you might have a mixture of different plants a lot of times you have, crump, uh, have clump forming uh, plants or creeping plants uh, that are going to, again, stay very close to the ground, uh, but again, add a lot of color and a lot of texture and a lot of pattern in combination with the other materials that they're mixed with. Uh, now, ground covers do some really important work in the landscape. Uh, of course, they, they can uh, allow for controlling soil erosion. If you have an area with a slope, adding in those ground covers can slow the movement of water, can take up some of that water, and prevent soil erosion. Uh, if you've got a, an area, a lot of, uh, just a lot of bare dirt, you, know, you can get a lot of heat off of that, so they can reduce heat. Uh, they're slowing, off, slowing that runoff. Uh, one of the important things they can do, you know, if you've got an area that might be very prone to weeds, you know, areas under trees where maybe grasses aren't going to grow very well, uh, then they, those ground covers can compete out those weeds and just look a lot more attractive. Uh, and again, you can also use them to define paths through the landscape. So, you know, as people move around your landscape, if you want to have them go a particular way, having those plants arranged can kind of just direct people uh, to the area of your landscape that you want to. Uh, when we are designing with ground covers, uh, we want to make uh, sure that we're paying attention to um, a, a variety of different things. You know, the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the size and shape of the bed that we're going to build. We want to make sure that that's going to be in proportion, really just look right in the uh, in proportion to the surrounding vegetation types, uh, the amount of garden space we have. Uh, we don't want just a, a huge massive bed that just kind of dominates everything. It needs to kind of fit uh, to the eye with what we're looking for. Uh, and one thing we do want to pay attention with a lot of the ground cover plants, they do have a, a vining habit or a prostrate habit. Uh, and because of that, they can tend to spread outside of the area where we originally plant them. Uh, so oftentimes we are going to need to, to go back uh, and edge them back and cut them back just to make sure that we're containing them uh, so that they don't try to conquer the rest of the landscape. Uh, you know, we do want to, you know, choose edging materials uh, that are going to complement that design, complement the character of what we have. Uh, very recently, I was building beds in the front of my house. Uh, my house has a, a, is, a, is brick, and it has kind of a gray and, and red brick. So uh, one of the things that was more difficult than just about anything else was finding a, a, a material 
to go around those beds that was going to match and, and look right with the color of brick I had. So uh, that probably took more effort uh, than actually choosing the plant material for those particular beds. Uh, when we are establishing a ground cover bed, there are again some things we want to think about. If we've got lawn weeds uh, or if we've got grass in an area, uh, we're going to want to remove those plants prior to when we're putting down our ground cover. Um, the most quick and efficient way of doing that is to use a herbicide uh, to just uh, kill that, kill down that grass. Uh, if you're uh, cautious about the use of herbicides, you can use a, a material to cover over the grass, whether that be cardboard or plastic sheeting, uh, just to, to block any sunlight. Uh, and over time, that will knock down that grass uh, and, allow, and allow you to come in and then till that under, um, add any soil amendments you need as, you know, after you've tilled the ground down to several inches. Uh, what that's going to do is that's going to loosen up your soil, make it, make it a lot easier for you to plant. Uh, now, we do have to worry about weed problems coming up in these beds, uh, so it is a good idea. Uh, to use a landscape fabric, uh, put that down, you know, something that's going to be permeable to water, uh, but not allow uh, weeds to come up through it. Uh, you can use that to kind of discourage any weeds that might be coming up in that ground cover area. Uh, and in addition to that, that weed fabric, you want to use a good layer of mulch, um, something like two inches of pine straw or bark. Uh, even gravel or stone works very well. Um, just uh, if you're going to use gravel and stone, you, you want to use something a little heavier uh, just to make sure that you're not going to have uh, weeds just immediately moving up through something like pea gravel, uh, which has kind of been my experience with that. Uh, where you're going to plant, of course, you're going to move that mulch aside, whatever that type of material is. Uh, you can cut an X into that fabric. Uh, usually you're going to cut about a six inch uh, section out uh, in that X shape and you can fold that back and then plant directly down into the ground. Uh, and one thing you do want to keep in mind as you're designing a ground cover bed is that your, your initial ground cover bed is not going to look uh, completely filled in uh, because you're starting with very small plants that are going to grow into their full mature size. Uh, so you want to be conscious of the mature size of that plant when you put it in uh, so that you don't wind up overcrowding the, uh, the beds. Uh, now in your first year with that ground cover bed, uh, you will need to do some weeding uh, as you, again, you've got you know, spaces between those plants that weeds are going to start trying to take advantage of. Uh, it is a good idea to make sure that you're maintaining a good watering in that area. Uh, those plants are newly established, and it's really easy for them to become water stressed. Uh, very often, of course, I, I am going to recommend that you do a soil test. Uh, we do have a soil test that would work very well for, for ground covers. Uh, but, you know, fertilizing in early spring with a complete fertilizer uh, is generally going to uh, you know, give those ground covers pretty much what they're going to need uh, in order to, to grow up to the size that we want them to be. Uh, and generally, in most soils, adding about two pounds per hundred square feet of one of these complete fertilizers is going to be kind of around the range where we want that to be. Uh, we do want to make sure we're putting, out, putting that out when the foliage is dry. We don't want to wind up burning any of the plants that way. Mm, so that's one thing I didn't know how much. All right, uh, so now I get to talk about some of the plants that I like for ground covers. Uh, it's always incumbent on me that I mention that um, anytime when I'm giving a list of plants like this, there's, there's just no way uh, that I can mention every single plant that would, would be really suitable for this. Uh, there are some excellent uh, uh, publications that you can find on the Extension website or MSU, uh, extension.msstate.edu website. 
um, that will really you know, give you long lists of different ground covers and other appropriate plants uh, for your landscape. But I just like to mention a few um, that I like uh, for various reasons, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of some of what your options are. And uh, bugleweed is a really attractive ground cover. Uh, it has these really nice blue flowers in the spring. Uh, it is a, a creeping perennial, so uh, it is going to last from year to year. Uh, it does have a, a spreading habit, uh, like a lot of ground covers that we're going to talk about. Uh, and as we talk about shade plants later, this is a plant that is going to be shade tolerant. Uh, it is going to, to lose its leaves in the fall. And, you know, while, you know, normally we think about ground covers, we think, think about them staying right next to the ground. Uh, bugleweed can get up to about three to six foot, uh, three to six inches, uh, which is, uh, again, you know, going to be fairly low. Uh, not all of the ground covers that we're going to mention are, are going to maintain uh, that quite, uh, you know, that quite of a, a, a short growth. Uh, you do want to make sure that you have well-drained soil for it. Uh, like a lot of plants, if you have wet conditions, uh, that can be a problem for this and some other plants we're going to talk about. Uh, really popular uh, plant, cast iron plant. Um, again, you know, a little bit taller. Cast iron plant can get up to, you know, as, as tall as three feet. Uh, so I think it works really well at, in combination uh, with other ground covers, you can see some examples of that in the images that we picked out here. Uh, works really well as a border around buildings or even a border around uh, landscape trees. Uh, does form clumps. Uh, one of the advantages of it is it really does tolerate dry conditions fairly well. It's going to keep coming back year after year. Uh, one thing that I do see pretty often on cast iron plant uh, is you wind up with some of the leaves that, uh, particularly at their tips, uh, start to get some, some browning there, uh, just as those leaves start to age out. Uh, so I think cast iron plant really uh, profits from going in and thinning out some of those older leaves, uh, just to, uh, to kind of keep it looking a little happier and healthier. Uh, but can be a really good plant to use. Again, really in combination with other uh, ground covers, uh, just because it has that difference in height with a lot of the other plants that we're gonna mention. Uh, holly fern, uh, I do enjoy ferns. Uh, they, they work really well as ground covers. Um, they they tolerate, tolerate wet conditions very well. Uh, so if you have an area where you might have water accumulate on occasion, uh, ferns tend to tolerate that. Uh, and they also tolerate shade very well. Uh, holly ferns get up uh, usually two feet to two and a half feet, uh, have a really interesting kind of yellowish to dark green leaf, and a lot of times we'll see variation uh, between leaves. And, and really the feature for ferns uh, is going to be the, the interesting leaf shape and, and leaf color that they have uh, that, uh, again, works really well around borders and around other plants in the landscape. Uh, one thing that I do always want to mention when we're talking about ferns, if you see the picture up in the top right, um, usually once or twice a year, uh, I'll get a, a picture like that, uh, and someone will ask me what's wrong with my fern plant. Uh, those structures on the bottom of the leaf are called sori or sori. Uh, and those are actually the, the reproductive structures for the fern, uh, so it's perfectly normal that those are there uh, and isn't doing anything bad to the fern. Uh, but again, ferns just have a, a really interesting leaf shape, uh, add a lot of interesting color, uh, work really well as ground covers. Um, not generally a plant I'm going to, uh, to recommend. Uh, sometimes I'm going to include one that, that may not be, a, be the best option. Uh, I think English ivy does a really good job as a house plant, uh, but if we get it out in the landscape occasionally, it can try to take over. Uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, uh, and uh, as you can see, it can be quite prolific, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to, to live in the United Kingdom for a little while and see some of the, 
the houses that look like they've been completely covered in ivy, uh, and it gives them a really fascinating look. Uh, but in the landscape, it tends to be really aggressive and start climbing, you know, starts climbing on things and can be a little bit difficult to fight back. So despite the fact that it can be really attractive, um, you know, you, you will wind up with 30 to 40 feet of vine. Uh, and if you are going to use ivy in the landscape, uh, it is really important to keep it cut back and, uh, and maintained just so it doesn't start climbing on everything. Uh, one of the, the uh, two, gra two ornamental grasses I'm going to talk about, uh, Liriope, uh, it's a really easy grass to maintain, uh, produces some, some really interesting flower shoots on it. Uh, you can see variation in color there from uh, that purple color uh, to a white flower. Uh, tolerates high sun conditions as well as shade, uh, usually somewhere between a, a foot to a foot and a half in height. Um, and it is a clumping perennial grass, um, has those really nice, um, you know, flowers that are come off, going to come off of it. Uh, and you can find uh, examples of it or varieties of liriope uh, that have really nice variegated foliage uh, that are just going to give a, a really nice feature to the landscape and, and look really nice. Uh, the most common issue people have with liriope uh, kind of similar to cast iron plant, the, the tips of the uh, leaves will start to brown. Uh, and that is a, or just a really common disease that we get on liriope. Uh, it's caused by a, an anthracnose fungus. Uh, the good thing about that is you can really just cut that liriope back, remove all of that old plant tissue, and it just grows right back and, uh, and looks even better. Uh, so because of that, I, you know, I'd say that this is a really easy plant to maintain. Uh, it doesn't tend to spread, uh, so I think it works really well as a, uh, as a border plant and a ground cover in the landscape. Uh, very similarly, monkey grass, uh, kind of in that, that same, you know, same group of plants, uh, very grass-like, clumping. Uh, very tolerant of drought, so if you have an area in your landscape where you really can't get water out to it, um, it's going to work. It's not going to fade in the winter. It's going to stick around. Uh, it tends to be a little shorter, about eight inches in height, uh, but again, uh, works very well as a, a plant. You know, again, uh, you know, placed in a, uh, a bed underneath trees or, or in a, uh, a bed to complement some other plants that you have, I think this works really well. Uh, moneywort is a, a really interesting plant. It has a, a, a creeping habit, so it tends to crawl along the ground. Uh, it tends to be fairly low-lying, anywhere from about three inches to about a foot and a half. Uh, really does prefer more sun, uh, and it does need a good well-drained soil. Um, but I really like it. You know, if you have a raised bed or a, an area near a, a you know, landscape where you can let it trail, uh, I think it looks really good in that use. Uh, has some, some really interesting color to the foliage, more of a yellow look to it, uh, and produces some really nice yellow flowers uh, that make a really good feature in the landscape. Um, Asiatic jasmine or Asian jasmine is a really common uh, ground cover, uh, particularly down here. Uh, another plant that does uh, have a vining habit, uh, and because of that, really needs to be cut back on a regular basis to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't try to conquer areas outside of the bed that it's put in. So uh, you do need to trim it back. It is really tolerant of dry conditions, um, will tolerate sun or shade, uh, stays green throughout the year. Uh, and again, you do have that, those variegated options just to add a little bit of additional color. Uh, similarly, there is Confederate jasmine, uh, which we uh, really appreciate for those uh, lovely white flowers that they have. Uh, it is evergreen, so you're, you're not going to see the, the loss of the leaves in the fall or, or winter. Uh, really needs to be planted in full sun. Uh, a little bit bigger, uh, 12 inches, uh, to as long as, as 10 feet, so quite a bit bigger uh, as we uh, 
uh, get to that. Uh, I do see a question, how can you kill uh, Asiatic jasmine? Um, that can be quite a challenge. My, my recommendation on that would be to, uh, uh, if you really have to kill it back, then, then herbicides are effective at doing that. Uh, just make sure that you, uh, uh, when you do that, that you uh, avoid drift to affect any plants that, that you don't want to remove. Uh, but uh, if you've planted it, you know, that, that is one of the things you need to be conscious of, um, that it does tend to spread fairly aggressively, so it does need to be fought back uh, if it starts to expand outside of that bed. Uh, Perry Winkle, uh, also known as Vinca Major and, and uh, Vinca Minor, uh, really attractive plant. Again, uh, you can see the uh, variegated foliage there and the really, really incredible purple flowers. Uh, likes partial shade. It, you're not going to use lose the leaves in the winter. Uh, has that vining habit, though. I just don't. It's not quite as aggressive as some of the other vining plants. Uh, anywhere from about 10 inches to about three feet in height. Uh, really, uh, really happy with this one. Uh, again, a really good plant for uh, putting around the base of some of our trees, uh, areas where grass may struggle. I think this plant does, does really well. Uh, and I do enjoy the, uh, uh, the flowers that you can get out of that. All right, a really popular one. Uh, this are, these are daylilies. Uh, you can see the, the fantastic variation that you can get in daylily flowers. Uh, all sorts of different colors uh, and flowering habits here. Um, the, the leaves tend to stick around. Of course, the flowers do not last very long. Uh, so normally we're going to plant these in uh, combination with other things and different kinds of daylilies. Um, so that we keep those flowers coming up for a longer period of time. Uh, usually we're going to see these about three feet tall, um, but uh, there will be, again, some, well, there's so many variations here, uh, that, or so, so many varieties uh, that you can, uh, you can get differences in height and differences in flower color and flower structure uh, that really make these attractive uh, as, as things you can add into the landscape. Now this is a plant uh, that is going to really thrive in full sun. Uh, so as a, you know, as a cover, you need to make sure that you're using this somewhere where they're going to be getting you know, six to eight hours of di direct unfiltered sun in a day. Uh, wild ginger does very well, about four to six inches in height. Uh, thrives in the shade, has those really nice uh, heart-shaped leaves, uh, which are really the feature that we're going for with this plant. Um, just a, another clumping perennial, uh, doesn't tend to spread very well, uh, so a, a good plant to use, uh, particularly in smaller areas. Uh, this is Ardesia, uh, another evergreen, another plant with that variegated foliage. Um, there are different varieties there, so uh, you might uh, see some varieties are going to be about 10 by 10 inches, uh, up to about 2 by 2 feet. Uh, you know, in addition to having the, the nice green foliage, you are going to get red berries uh, in the winter. It uh, has that clumping habit, uh, and uh, you can, you know, depending on the variety that you're going to get, you're either going to see really nice dark leaves uh, or those interesting variegated leaves. Uh, and it's a, a plant that, again, works really well under shade conditions. Uh, Louisiana iris, um, of course, uh, down here in the southern part of the, uh, the state, of course, we uh, have a, a lot of these around, uh, really great for wet areas, uh, like uh, you know, full sun, uh, can be quite large with uh, grass-like leaves, uh, and of course, the, the absolutely gorgeous flowers that they put up uh, in all sorts of different colors from a, kind of a deep blue to yellow and pinks and lavenders. 
uh, work fantastic and, and bloom, bloom prolifically in the spring, uh, relatively easy to maintain, uh, and relatively easy to propagate. So uh, something that you can, uh, can spread to other areas of the landscape relatively easily. Uh, speaking of purple flowers, indigo has absolutely gorgeous flowers, uh, thrives in partial shade, uh, tends to, to grow up to be about two foot by two foot, uh, spreads out, but it has kind of a shrubby, uh, shrub growth habit, uh, really interesting flowers on it, uh, very fine foliage, uh, so, but a, a very attractive plant uh, to use as ground cover. All right, I uh, want to talk just uh, for a little bit about some plants that are going to work well in the shade. Uh, and as we're doing that, we want to talk about, you know, having those shade conditions in the landscape. Um, so having shade, shade trees particularly is beneficial um, because if you have those shade trees near your house, uh, they're actually going to reduce some of your cooling needs. Uh, if those plants are deciduous, as they open up, it, as they lose their leaves in the winter, they're actually going to let a little bit of more sun through uh, and allow you to get a little bit of extra heat during the cool season. Uh, those shade trees are also providing food, nesting habitat, and shelter for birds and mammals that we uh, enjoy having in the landscape. Uh, so shade trees are really valuable. Having those shaded areas is a, uh, is a virtue. Uh, so, oftentimes when we're talking about shade, uh, we, you hear terms like full shade or light shade or half shade. Uh, so, we want to understand what we mean when we use those terms. Uh, so, when we're talking about full or dense shade, um, that tends to occur where we have, you know, an area under trees that are broad-leaved, uh, plants like magnolia or oaks or maples. Uh, other hardwood trees, uh, and that tends to largely block a lot of the light that's going to get down underneath those trees. So that's what we mean when we say full or dense shade. And so plants that we put there uh, really have to be tolerant of continuous low light conditions. When we talk about light shade or filtered light, uh, you know, that tends to happen when we see plants or, or have trees that are high branched or have open canopies or fine thin leaves. So a good example of that would be the, the ground underneath pine trees uh, would, would tend to be more what we would be referring to as light shade. Uh, now half shade or part shade uh, would refer to an area that's going to be getting full sun part of the day and shaded for the remainder of the day. So uh, areas that are right adjacent to your house, uh, other structures in the landscape that cast shadows for part of the day, but then allow that sunlight for the remainder time, that would be half shade or part shade. And that just kind of breaks down those different terms for you. So when you see the description of the plant, you can understand what that term means. And we wanna make sure that we're selecting the plants based on the degree of light that they need. Um, because if we wind up selecting a plant that, that's not going to uh, thrive under those conditions, it's just not going to perform well. Uh, so uh, we do want to be conscious that very few shade plants are going to give us continuous blooms. Uh, that, that tends to be more of something that we see out in, uh, in full sun plants. Uh, oftentimes, we are going to uh, be placing them underneath trees, uh, so they are going to be competing for water with those larger plants. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're going to get the moisture that they require. So, uh, you know, particularly if you're looking for plants that are going to be lower maintenance, uh, planting, uh, you know, going with plants that are going to be a little bit drought tolerant, uh, is going to be a good idea just because uh, it, it's, it's likely to wind up being in those conditions. Um, so, you know, since we may not be getting plants that, that flower all the time, you know, having other design elements, things like good texture or foliage color uh, is a really good idea. Uh, and using plants in combination uh, really allows us to uh, have a lot more interest in these plantings uh, rather than relying on, on just one type of plant. Uh, so I always like talking about shade trees. Uh, so we're going to go from the, the tallest to the smallest. 
Uh, and start off when we're talking about uh, Japanese red maple. Uh, this is a partial shade plant, uh, so it works well as an understory tree. Um, the, uh, the actual red maple, as opposed to the Japanese red maple, is a much larger tree. Uh, Japanese red maple gets up to about 25 feet uh, and has a really nice fine red foliage in the fall. Uh, gives a lot of fall color. Uh, now here in Mississippi, you know, we, we just don't get the, some of the fantastic color that they get in other areas of the, uh, the country uh, as we get into the fall. But having some trees like this in the landscape uh, can really bring in a lot of color and, and a lot of interest. And like the uh, other maple trees, uh, Japanese red maple, uh, flowers very early in the spring, uh, so it's a great way to provide a little bit of a nectar source to those native bees uh, and other pollen-seeking insects that are, are you know, beneficial in our landscapes uh, by having them there. Uh, very popular tree, dogwood trees, uh, thrive in partial shade. Uh, oftentimes if we, uh, we put dogwoods out as a specimen tree in the landscape, they don't perform well. Um, but if you put them in as an understory tree uh, or as a tree that's on the border of your landscape, uh, they perform fantastically. Um, they do uh, produce some wonderful flowers in the spring. Uh, and there are varieties, most of the varieties are white, but there are some uh, you know, varieties with different colors to their flowers. Um, you do want to be cautious that you, you get a disease resistant variety. Uh, there were some uh, issues uh, with, uh, with plant diseases in dogwoods, but most of the varieties that you purchase these days uh, are going to be resistant to those diseases uh, and, uh, and do a lot better in the landscape. Uh, one of my personal favorite trees, the red mud, um, just uh, I think they do fantastic. It's one of the first, uh, kind of like a red maple, um, they're going to be one of the first plants that are going to produce flowers in the spring, uh, but they are really dramatic about how they put on those flowers. Uh, they actually produce their flowers before the leaves come out in the spring, um, so you can see them just uh, really just covered with flowers, uh, and oftentimes as you drive down the highways or the interstate, uh, you'll see them at the border of the, uh, of the roads, uh, just being really showy, uh, and of course, while the buds are red, uh, the leaves have that really nice sort of pink or lavender color, uh, and then as the leaves come out, I really like the leaves on this plant as well. Uh, they have a really broad kind of heart-shaped leaf uh, that, that does get a little bit of color to it, uh, and I think is really attractive. Now, uh, they can get as big as 30 feet, uh, though um, I do often see them be quite a good bit smaller than that. Uh, and again, they, they really thrive at borders uh, and as understory trees. So, you know, adding some color underneath larger trees is a really good role for this one. Uh, talking about shrubs, one of my personal favorite is red buckeye. Uh, red buckeye uh, gets included in my presentations when I talk about hummingbird and butterfly plants. Uh, because it's very popular with those, uh, produces those wonderful uh, clusters of red flowers, uh, will grow in anything from partial to full shade, uh, can get as big as 20 feet, um, has really nice foliage to it, uh, does a really good job you know, of filling in areas, um, produces very well, and again, it, it's really going to draw in a lot of butterflies and a lot of hummingbirds, so not only are you getting the attractiveness of the, uh, of the flowers, uh, but you're also getting those other features. Uh, now, uh, another one I'm very fond of is beautyberry. Uh, not a plant that we're really looking at for its flowers, um, because the, the flowers are, are fairly subtle for American beautyberry, uh, but the berries themselves are not. Uh, the native varieties here in Mississippi all produce those uh, really nice per clusters of purple berries. Um, this uh, will, will thrive in partial to full shade. 
Um, and while I, you know, my, my notes there say uh, eight feet, um, the uh, beautyberry plants can get quite large uh, and are extraordinarily easy to spread from one area to another. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they work really well underneath other trees or at borders uh, or, you know, beside a house. Um, the uh, cane, the, the uh, branches tend to go out like canes and kind of droop over with all of those berries. Uh, there are some other varieties that have been produced uh, that have different colors. So you will see varieties of beauty berry uh, with green berries or white berries or red or even, even black berries on them. Uh, but a really attractive plant uh, that really thrives in a lot of different conditions. It'll tolerate moisture. Uh, it'll tolerate drier conditions. It's just a, a very adaptable plant. Uh, sweet shrub um, is, uh, again, it, it has a, a shrubbing habit, uh, puts on some really nice uh, maroon spring, uh, maroon blooms in the spring, uh, has a, a nice smell to it. Uh, the foliage is, is fairly, it's, you know, fairly basic, uh, but the, the flowers are really attractive, uh, and it does tolerate those shade conditions. Uh, it can get quite large, but it's rel relatively easy to train back uh, if we need to keep it down to a, uh, a smaller habit. Uh, and of course, we do have to talk about camellias. Um, they will tolerate partial shade, uh, put on absolutely fantastic flowers uh, from the, from the uh, winter into the spring. Uh, and of course, camellias can get quite large. Uh, again, it is possible to, to prune and shape them back. Uh, there are two broad varieties or, or types of camellias. Uh, the Sasanqua camellia, uh, which gets anywhere from uh, 2 to 12 feet, uh, tends to have wider pink flowers that are quite large uh, and uh, tends to bloom in early winter. Uh, and then the Japonicas, which can be anywhere from 6 foot up to 25 feet. Uh, so it can be quite large plants, uh, tend to have larger leaves, and tend to bloom in late winter. And they tend to have larger flowers, and there's a wider array of different colors uh, for the Japonica than for the Sasanqua. Uh, both of these plants do fantastic in the landscape. Uh, the flowers are gorgeous and smell wonderful, uh, so a wonderful plant to include in the landscape. Uh, the most common problem people run into with camellias uh, is that they are a little bit prone to scale insects, uh, so something you want to watch for on them, uh, but they tend, do tend to uh, get that problem. But, it, but it, it's relatively easy to uh, maintain and, uh, and take care of. Uh, mountain hydrangea, uh, another plant with just a really gorgeous flower. Uh, really enjoy the uh, the color of those flowers uh, that uh, just ap appear in, in huge clusters. Uh, really nice large leaves on the plant. Uh, tolerates partial to full shade. Uh, gets up to about five foot. And uh, one of the things that's really great is it tends to, uh, to bloom in the summer uh, after we see a lot of other blooms start to fade. All right, uh, some other plants. Uh, again, another plant that's going to uh, operate well in wet areas, uh, elephant ear. Uh, there are a huge number of varieties of elephant ear with all sorts of different color variations in their leaves from uh, kind of a, a basic green uh, to all sorts of variegation with dark blues uh, and purples and blacks and reds and greens. It uh, has a really large tropical style leaf on it uh, and works really well in partial shade as well as working well in, in wetter conditions. Uh, hostas are classic shade plant, uh, all sorts of variation in our leaves, uh, so all sorts of variegated varieties uh, in, in uh, different types of, uh, of leaf shape and leaf colors. Uh, so uh, just a lot of variety, uh, has a good clumping habit, so um, doesn't tend to take over the world where you put it, uh, but a, a very good plant to include. 
Uh, Trillium uh, gets its name, has a really uh, interesting flower shape, uh, works well in partial to full shade, um, grows about a foot tall, uh, has some really nice colors everywhere from, again, you'll see those white flowers and red flowers uh, that are just uh, fantastic. Uh, and I just think it has an interesting look to it. Uh, the structure of the plant is interesting, and I think it adds an interesting note in the landscape. Uh, there are some vines that work well also, uh, including another uh, personal favorite, Maypop or Passion Vine. Uh, of course, I like them because their, their flowers are just kind of ridiculous. Uh, have that purple uh, outer flower with really frilly edges. Uh, and then the, uh, the yellow uh, internal parts of flower are just give it a really interesting structure. Um, we'll tolerate partial shade. Uh, the vines can, uh, can get quite long, as much as 15 feet. Uh, and again, we do see this flowering in the summer. Uh, climbing hydrangea, of course, we have those, those big clusters of flowers that we would expect from hydrangeas. Uh, like partial to full shade uh, plant that's going to be really you know, interesting as a trellis plant in a, in a shady area. Uh, really gorgeous flowers, uh, larger leaves. Uh, so a uh, plant I think works very well. And uh, pepper vine, uh, a lot of times I find myself trying to get rid of this plant, but uh, some people do enjoy it. Uh, tolerates partial shade, uh, can, uh, can climb about 15 feet. Uh, and does produce those, uh, those black fruit on it. Uh, has that a uh, really interesting leaf shape. Uh, so it does work all right as a, a, a vine for a shady area. Uh, so with that said, um, that uh, 